too bright in the city, but on a moonless night in a truly dark place, you can easily see the Andromeda galaxy with your naked eye, and it is the most distant object in the universe that can be seen without the aid of a telescope. The Andromeda galaxy is about 2.2 million light years away, which means that if you go out to the mountains or the desert this weekend, look up. This weekend actually wouldn't be good because the moon's going to be pretty bright. But if you go out and look at the Andromeda galaxy this fall, the light that enters your eye that night left that galaxy 2,200,000 years ago on its journey through space. When that light first was radiated by the stars in that galaxy, there were no humans on planet Earth. Humans had not yet evolved. Think about that for a second. So regardless of that, again, our sky is dominated by the Milky Way. Here's another full sky view as well. This one is slightly different in the way that it's been put together. But once again, we see how the Milky Way appears in our sky. And the reason that I include this one, this image, is to compare it to this image. This is the galaxy NGC 4565. It doesn't have a name. It just has a catalog number. And this is a galaxy similar to our own Milky Way. It is an entirely separate galaxy from our own Milky Way. And I think if you look at the character of this image, the qualities of this image, that looks strikingly similar to that. And so our Milky Way galaxy turns out to be just one galaxy out of hundreds of billions of galaxies across a much larger universe. And keep in mind, our sun, our solar system, is one star among the half trillion stars within the Milky Way. And if you're starting to feel small at this point, that's good. So these numbers that I'm bandying about are fairly new because it was only within the last uh, 104 years that we actually had a sense of how large the Milky Way is and um, how and where the sun is within the Milky Way. For a very long time, astronomers had attempted to understand the extent of the Milky Way, which in the 17th and 18th centuries was regarded as the entire universe. In fact, really, up until the early part of the 20th century, there was no important distinction, conceptually, between the galaxy and the universe. We'll get into some of that discussion a little bit later on. But in the mid-1700s, the British astronomer, Sir um, William Herschel, one of the leading astronomers of the 18th century, attempted to determine how big the galaxy is and where the sun is within it. And he did this by conducting what we call star counts. And it is exactly as it sounds, Herschel would point his telescope at a certain direction in the sky, he would look through the telescope, and he would literally count the number of stars he could see. And he would write that down. And then he would go to a different part of the sky and count all the stars he could see there and write it down. And he did this for the entire sky visible from England. And then he used those numbers in all the different directions in the sky to put together this estimate for the shape of the Milky Way and the sun's location within the Milky Way. And what he came up with was, as you can see, kind of a blob-like structure with the sun near, not exactly at, but near the center. And he said the overall width of this was maybe about 800 parsecs, or that's around 2,400 light years. This was the first real uh, quantifiable attempt to figure out the size and scope of the Milky Way. 
And unfortunately, it was completely wrong. Because one of the things that Herschel did not understand, and in fact no astronomer understood in the 18th century, was the fact that those clouds, those dark clouds, blocks our view of more distant stars. And so in those directions, of course, he counted fewer stars. And his assumption was, well, there just aren't that many stars in that direction, not realizing that there are many more stars than he could see because those clouds were blocking his view of the more distant stars. This is what we call in science a selection effect or an observational bias. Of course, by the 20th century, astronomers began to understand the effect of this interstellar extinction blocking our view of more distant stars. It wasn't until the beginning of the 20th century, however, that we finally had an accurate estimate of the size of the Milky Way and the location of the sun within it. And this estimate came from the American astronomer Harlow Shapley, who published in 1918 the first accurate assessment of the size of the Milky Way. And Shapley did this by using a specific kind of star that serves as what we call a standard candle. Now the basic idea of a standard candle is simply that it is some kind of object that is of known or predictable brightness that can be used to determine distance. We use the word candle because a candle, of course, is something that emits light. So think of it in these terms, is if someone were to hold a candle up right in front of your face, it would have a certain brightness, yes? But if you take that candle and walk down the street with it, by the time you're a block away, the candle is going to look much fainter, is it not? Yes. Yeah. So you can compare how bright the candle looks at that distance to how bright it looked right in front of your face, and that comparison in brightness allows one to determine distance. This is the basic concept associated with the distance modules that we discussed before. Now, one type of standard candle, there are many different kinds of standard candles, but one particular type are called pulsating variable stars. These are stars that pass through a part of the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram called the instability strip. We didn't get into those details when we were talking about the HR diagram, but the basic idea is that these are post-main sequence stars that pass through a phase of instability as they evolve from main sequence to more advanced uh, stages in their lives. And the stars literally pulsate. These are stars that expand and contract with a regular, repeatable period. And as they expand and the surface area increases, that drives the luminosity up. As they contract, the surface area decreases, and that drives the luminosity down. And the, what, as it turns out, the pulsation period, how long it takes them to complete one pulsation, is directly related to the luminosity of the star. And remember, luminosity is basically the same thing as absolute magnitude. Now, there are three basic kinds of pulsating variable stars. The details of these are not going to be that important. What will be more important is the fact simply that we can use them to determine distance. The three kinds you see listed here are called RR Lyman stars, named after the first star of this class that was discovered, the star RR Lyman which is whatever letter R is. So there's about 26 letters in the alphabet, so R is somewhere around you know, 18 or something. So it's the 18th variable star discovered in the constellation Lyra, and it turns out to be a specific kind of pulsating variable star that pulsates in only about a day, which is really convenient. It's a short time to measure that pulsation period. The problem with our r stars is that they're not super bright, which means they're very useful over comparatively short distances, 
but they're not very useful over very large distances. Because over very large distances, they're difficult to identify because of their faintness. The brightest of the pulsating variables are the Myra variables. Extremely bright and easy to identify over a long distance, but they have two problems. One problem is they have very long pulsation periods, which makes it very time consuming to measure the period, but the relationship between period and luminosity is not as good for Myra's as it is for the other two classes. And in between, are the Cephei variables, named after the star Delta Cephei, the um, fourth brightest star in the constellation Cepheus, which was the first star of this class that was discovered. These stars pulsate in about a week, still not hard to measure that period, and they are bright enough to be seen over very great distances. And by measuring the period, the period of pulsation is uniquely related to the luminosity and thus the absolute magnitude. And just thinking back to earlier in the semester, if you compare apparent magnitude to absolute magnitude, that allows us to calculate the distance to the star. And if that star is in a cluster or a galaxy, that also then allows us to determine the distance to that cluster or galaxy. So the bottom line is, these pulsating variable stars can be used to determine distance. And that is what Shapley did. Shapley identified Cepheid variable stars within what we call globular clusters. There were a couple of images of globular clusters shown uh, in the video that we watched at the beginning of class. Here is an example of a globular cluster. First of all, the name, the term globular cluster, refers to the fact that they are roughly spherical clusters of stars. Hence, they're basically globes. And they typically contain several hundred thousand stars, all com um, located within a small volume of space. So this cluster, known as the Hercules Cluster, because it is behind the stars of the constellation Hercules, also known by its catalog number, M13. This particular cluster, as you can see, is 25,000 light years away, but it's only about 150 light years across. And yet, it contains, in this case, around half a million stars. Because there are so many stars packed so closely together, globular clusters are extremely bright objects and easy to identify over even very great distances away. The stars in globular clusters are among the oldest stars that exist in the galaxy. And globular clusters as objects orbit the center of our Milky Way and are evenly distributed around the Milky Way. So it was in objects like this, and by the way, this is the nearest and brightest globular cluster in the Northern Hemisphere. The brightest globular cluster in the entire sky is the globular cluster uh, Omega Centauri, which is uh, visible only in the Southern Hemisphere. And it is also a naked eye object. So the folks down in the Southern Hemisphere, they have naked eye galaxies, naked eye clusters, naked eye nebulae. <laughs> Um, they have lots of stuff, lots more stuff to see in the sky than we do in the Northern Hemisphere. But it was in these globular clusters that Shapley was able to identify pulsating variable stars. And the reason he wanted to do that is because of the fact that globular clusters not only orbit the center of the galaxy, and incidentally, here's a, a, a quick uh, stylistic note for you is that when we talk about the galaxy with a capital G, we're talking about our galaxy. When we talk about other galaxies, we use galaxy with a lowercase g. So that is a distinction that you should be aware of as you read the notes. So not only do globular clusters orbit the center of the galaxy, but they are symmetrically evenly distributed 
around the center of the galaxy. And so if we could just kind of map out where all the globular clusters are in space, the center of their distribution would coincide pretty closely to the center of the Milky Way itself. And it was Shapley in 1918 who was the first one to actually do this. And when Shapley measured the distances to those globular clusters, this is what he got. Right, so before Shapley, we knew what directions they were in space, but it wasn't until Shapley that we had distances to the globular clusters. And this is the actual product that he published in 1918. So that marks the location of the sun, and each of these black dots represents the direction to and the distance to several dozen globular clusters uh, that he used in his study. Now, this is, of course, a two-dimensional representation, so globular clusters are three-dimensionally uh, distributed in space, but he took all those clusters and just paid, put them onto a flat plane to show the distribution relative to the center of the galaxy. And so the overall center of this distribution is marked by the red X. That marks the center of the Milky Way. And so the first thing that was shown is that the sun is not near the center of the Milky Way. And based upon the distances that Shapley measured, the sun was somewhere around 30,000 light years from the center of the galaxy. The sun also appeared to be roughly two thirds of the way out from the center giving an overall size of 100,000 light years across. Now keep in mind, prior to that, astronomers thought that the galaxy was maybe a little over 2,000. So in 1918, with the publication of Shapley's paper, our understanding of the size of the Milky Way went from 2,000 to 100,000 light years across. And in 1918, that was mind-blowing. The astronomical community and the public at large was shocked by this result. No one had suspected prior to that that the galaxy was as large as it turned out to be. The best modern estimates for the size of the Milky Way are similar. However, the Milky Way extends beyond the visible disk that we see in the sky. So this is a modern representation of the Milky Way and the various different components of the Milky Way. As it turns out, our galaxy has de several different structural components, what we call morphological components, that all together make up <coughs> our galaxy. But the overall width of the disk of the galaxy, which is where the sun resides, so the sun, again, is roughly two-thirds of the way out from the center of the galaxy. This slide says 28,000. Best estimates right now are about 27,000 light years. But the overall width of the disk of the galaxy is about 100,000 light years across. However, there are other parts of the disk that, uh, not disk, there are other parts of the galaxy that extend out even farther such that the overall, the full size of the Milky Way is actually somewhere between 150 and 200,000 light years across. Now keep in mind what this means is that it, that means it would take a beam of light 200,000 years to travel entirely across the galaxy, depending on what we define to be part of the galaxy. 100,000 years to go across just the disk of the galaxy. Okay? So th these numbers, of course, again, were staggered in 1918 and fundamentally altered our understanding not only of the galaxy, but of the universe. But again, in 1918, still the words galaxy and universe were kind of synonymous. Astronomers did not distinguish between the Milky Way and the rest of the universe. But that would change, of course, as we will see in a subsequent lecture. Now in this slide, you can see 
the three basic parts of the Milky Way label. The galaxy is defined first by the disk, and it is within the disk that the majority of stars and the nebulae exist. But at the center of the disk is a spheroidal region. It's not a perfect sphere. It is kind of a flattened out, elongated sphere. It's, as it turns out, it's shaped more like a rugby ball than anything else. But there is this spheroidal component in the center of the disk called the central bulge, or as it is labeled here, simply the bulge. And then surrounding the rest of the galaxy is a region called the halo. And within the halo, you see all of these hundreds of globular clusters distributed around the center of the galaxy. The halo is mostly empty space. It is populated by a low density, very hot gas, continuously emitting soft X-ray glow. It's populated by the globular clusters. And there's a low density of stars drifting around in the halo as well. Those are among the very oldest stars that exist in the galaxy, as well as, well as the stars in the globular clusters. So the disk, the bulge, the halo are the main parts of the Milky Way. And what we will do next is uh, discuss what those uh, parts are and what their properties are. But before we get into that, as was mentioned again in the video that we watched at the beginning of class, it takes the sun, based upon the sun's speed, the sun is moving through space at a speed of about 250 kilometers per second. That is measured according to what we call the local standard of rest. So we use all the stars around the sun to figure out how fast the sun is moving through space. It's around 250 kilometers per second. That's like and 175 miles an hour, right? Take... No, per second, per not second. per hour. Oh, sorry. Okay, so take that and multiply by 3,600. So 250 kilometers per second, not per hour, is the speed with which the sun is moving through space. And given the distance of the sun from the center of the galaxy, and assuming a circular orbit, it would take the sun approximately 250 <coughs> billion years to complete one orbit around the center of the Milky Way. And in the five billion year age of the sun, the sun has been around the galaxy <coughs> every 20 years. I suppose we could call that one galactic year. So one galactic year is 250 solar years. So the sun is 20 galactic years old. I guess that means the sun is not yet old enough to drink. So as I, I've just stated, over the last century, studies of the Milky Way have revealed three distinct morphological components, the disk, the bulge, and the halo. So let's talk a little bit about the properties of each of these. So we'll start by describing the galactic disk. Again, as you saw in that slide, it's broad, it's flat, it has an overall width of around 100,000 light years, but its thickness is only about 2,000 light years thick. So the thickness is 2% of the width. So it's really quite thin. And it is in, uh, and there's a notation here that the full extent of the galaxy, however, extends beyond that. That is including the halo and other parts of the galaxy as well. Now, the properties of the galactic disk are as follows. First of all, the disk is rich in gas and dust. And that should be evident based upon the slides that we saw before. So taking a look at the Milky Way, this is the disk as it appears in our entire sky. So remember, it's not just the light of the stars, but it's also those dark patches that represent those massive clouds of gas and dust. So it is all along the disk of the galaxy that these many, many clouds of gas and dust exist in space. 
I mentioned earlier, but let me restate now, that yes, the glowing part of the Milky Way is mostly the blended light of stars, but remember the stars here and the stars there are also part of the Milky Way. The sun is in the disk, and so from our vantage point in the disk, most of the stars of the galaxy are next to us, but there are some above us, not many, and there are some below us, not many. So we see many fewer stars above us and below us in the galaxy. We see most of the stars next to us in the galaxy. And keep in mind, this is the entire sky, so this part of the image wraps around and connects to that part of the image, so it is a complete circle around the Earth. That is the direction toward the center of the galaxy. That is the central bulge. This is what we see in the summertime. In the wintertime, like right now in our sky, the Milky Way is not as bright because in the wintertime, we're looking away from the center of the galaxy. So this here and this here, that's the wintertime part of the Milky Way for us in the Northern Hemisphere. All right, so the disk, again, is rich in gas and dust. And it is in this gas and dust, in these vast clouds of interstellar gas and dust, these vast nebulae, remember that is where star formation occurs. So as star formation occurs, there are always new stars being formed within the disk of the galaxy. And so the disk contains both old stars that formed long ago and are still burning, namely the low mass stars, as well as high mass stars that by the very fact that they are high mass means that they are young. How long do high mass stars live? Just a few million years. Right? So they live and die very quickly. So the fact that there are any high mass stars at all in the disk means that they are young. So it is only within the disk that we see young stars. Other parts of the galaxy contain only old stars. And the reason that there can be uh, young stars, uh, the high mass young stars in the disk, is because there is the continuous star formation taking place within the nebulae that replaces the young stars, the high mass stars, as they quickly burn out and die. So the disk contains both old low mass stars and young high mass stars. What temperatures are high mass stars? They're hotter. What? They are hot. And what color is associated with hot? Blue. Blue. And so as it turns out, the overall appearance of the disk is blue. And this is true not only for the Milky Way, but for other spiral galaxies as well. The disks of spiral galaxies have a very characteristically blue color because the light of the disk is dominated by the high temperature, high luminosity, high mass stars. Another important characteristic of the disk, which is distinct from the other parts of the galaxy, is that the disk is chemically enriched by the post-main sequence evolution of stars. Whether it's planetary nebulae in the, uh, shed by intermediate mass stars, supernovae shed by high mass stars as they explode, as each generation of stars lives and dies, as they synthesize the elements beyond nitrogen, which again, remember, is basically everything on the periodic table. Supernovae, planetary nebulae return these atoms back into space. So with each passing generation of stars, the metal abundance of the disk increases. Notice I have the term metal in quotation marks. This is a peculiar, uh, uh, esoteric term used in astronomy. To say metal does not imply actual metal. When we talk about metal, we're talking about any element 
heavier than helium. So in astronomy, everything except hydrogen and helium are grouped together with a single term, metals, because they are the products of fusion in stars. So the metallicity, or the metal abundance of the disk is higher than other parts of the galaxy because of the many generations of high mass stars that have lived and died in the current age of the galaxy, which is probably around 12 and a half to 13 and a half billion years old. Okay? When we put all of these characteristics together, this is what we describe as a population one environment. Population one is defined as high metallicity, lots of gas and dust, and the presence of high mass, high temperature, young stars. Now, when we look at the various different kinds of objects, what we call OB associations, these are uh, collections, small clusters of O and B stars, the very brightest and hottest of all the main sequence stars. When we look at the ionized hydrogen and especially the molecular clouds, what that reveals is that the disk itself has a spiral structure. So here we see uh, a pretty good representation of the distribution of all the gas and dust and high mass stars that exist in the galaxy. Now there's some interpolation going on here because there are parts of the galaxy that are difficult for us to observe. Right, so from the sun's location here, we can't really see very well the stuff that's on the other side of the bulge. The bulge blocks our view. So we're kind of filling in the details based upon the rest of the details. But still, for most of the galaxy, we can directly observe the distribution of blue stars and the distribution of hydrogen. Hydrogen emits a very characteristic uh, wavelength or frequency of radio light. It's called 21 centimeter radiation. Because what happens is in the hydrogen atom, so uh, not long ago we talked a little bit about quantum numbers, that particles have a set of quantum numbers that describe them. One of the quantum numbers is spin. Electrons have spin. And the spin is described as an up spin or a down spin. And electrons, every once in a while, completely randomly flip their spin. They go from up to down, down to up, they just flip. And every time they do that, they emit a 21 centimeter photon, which we can easily detect with our radio telescopes. We use that 21 centimeter radiation to map out all the hydrogen in the galaxy. And the hydrogen takes on this spiral structure. So do the stars. When we map out all of the high temperature, high luminosity blue stars, which are easy to see over even very great distances because they are very bright stars. When we map out all those blue stars, we see the same spiral structure. Now keep in mind, we are confined to our solar system. We cannot go outside of our Milky Way and see our own galaxy from above. But if we could, if we could travel high above the plane of the galaxy and look down on the galaxy, this is what we would see. The position of the sun is not near the center, which is a good thing. We're, again, roughly two-thirds of the way out on the very edge of a spiral arm called the Orion Spur of the Perseus arm of the galaxy. There are two major spiral arms. There are other smaller features that make up the Milky Way as well. And as the sun itself 
moves in a roughly circular orbit around the galaxy, again taking about a quarter of a billion years to go around the galaxy once. As the sun does this, it actually moves from one arm to an inter-arm space to another arm. Stars move from arm to arm. And the sun does as well. As it turns out, right now, we just happen to be on the edge of one of these arms. So the disk is not just a flat disk, but the matter, the gas, and the stars are concentrated, making a spiral structure. And as we will see, spiral galaxies like our Milky Way are very common in the universe. And here is a separate galaxy to our own. Again, it does not have a proper name. It is simply referred to by its catalog number, NGC 6744. And this is probably pretty much exactly what our Milky Way looks like if we could go outside and see it. And notice, as we look at the disk of this galaxy, notice how blue those spiral arms appear. That is because of the light that is emitted by those many high mass, high temperature young stars that are constantly being formed within all those clouds. And look at all those red, those pink, red spots. Those are all each two regions. Those are all regions of star formation. So new stars are constantly being formed, living and dying within the disk. And those blue stars dominate the light of the disk of the galaxy. The shape and structure of this disk is probably exactly like our own Milky Way. Go ahead. Is that an actual picture? This is an actual photograph. This particular galaxy, as you can see, is about 31 million light years away. So it takes 31 million years for the light to go from that galaxy to the Earth. Now, when you look in the center of this galaxy, you'll see the central bulge is not blue. It has a very different color. It's much redder in appearance. It looks yellow. Yellow is red compared to blue. So the um, the disk of the galaxy is one component, but then we get into the central bulge of the galaxy. So the central bulge, again, is, a, is an ellipsoidal shape. Ellipsoidal simply means a three-dimensional ellipse as opposed to a, two, a flat two-dimensional ellipse. In other words, that's shaped more like a rugby ball than it is like a sphere. And this, of course, is located at the very center of the galactic disk. The overall size, the largest axis of the central bulge, is about 12,000 light years across. Much smaller than the overall size of the uh, disk of the galaxy. And because the central bulge of the Milky Way is elongated, because it is not perfectly spherical, the Milky Way is characterized as being what we call a barred spiral galaxy. So here, um, in this image, we see that the, the central bulge of the Milky Way is elongated, connecting that spiral arm to that spiral arm. That is characteristic of a specific type of spiral galaxy called a barred spiral because there is this bar of material running through the center of the galaxy that is distinct from other spiral galaxies that have spherical central bulges. And we'll see comparisons of those later on when we talk about galaxies in general. But for now, the Milky Way is a barred spiral, and that shows the sun's orbit around the center of the galaxy, where again you can see that path carries it at different times between spiral arms. Now, the properties of the bulge are very different than the properties of the disk. The bulge is characterized by mostly just 
old stars. Now, which stars live to be old? Low mass. Low mass. What kind of temperatures do low mass stars have? Low, te low temperature. And what color is associated with low temperature? Red. Red. Red or redder. So the disk, or pardon me, the bulge, compared to the disk, has a much redder appearance. We saw that in the photograph of that spiral galaxy. There's a much redder appearance of the bulge compared to the disk. And when we probe the, not literally physically probe, but when we look at the central bulge of our Milky Way and of other galaxies, we see that there's very little gas and dust present within the central bulge. So there's no raw material from which new stars can form. Thus, there is only an old stellar population present within the central bulge. And because they are all old stars that formed early in the history of the galaxy, there is a characteristically low metallicity. The longer ago a star formed, the lower its metallicity will be. Or conversely, the more recently a star formed, the higher its metallicity will be. Because again, as time goes by, the metallicity of the disk increases the metallicity of the galaxy increases, and so newly formed stars will be formed from this higher metal content. Stars that formed early in the history of the galaxy formed before that enrichment took place, and thus they have a lower metallicity. And that is what we see in the center ball. So this is all, it all fits together. Low metallicity, old, low mass stars, everything fits together. All these different aspects of theory and observation tie together very nicely to give us confidence that we have an accurate understanding of how the system works. Now these characteristics, old stars, little gas and dust, low metallicity, these characteristics define what we call a population two environment. <clears throat> Any questions about the central bulge? One thing to add is that at the very center of the bulge itself is the galactic nucleus. The galactic nucleus has a proper name. It is called Sagittarius A, and it is a super massive black hole with a mass of about four and a half million times the mass of the sun. And we saw images, I showed you an image of this when we were talking about um, black holes, but here is an actual photograph of the black hole at the center of the Milky Way. Obviously we're not seeing the black hole itself, but this is an image of the accretion disk of matter surrounding the black hole at the center of the Milky Way. This is another image of it, which again, the resolution here, 42 micro arc seconds. That's again, four times 10 to the minus fifth seconds of arc. Once again, that's like trying to photograph a dime from the Earth, trying to photograph a dime on the surface of the moon. And so this is an extraordinarily uh, impressive technological feat to achieve these extremely high resolutions. And here, uh, just for scale, we see the accretion disk relative to the orbit of Mercury uh, around somewhere in the middle there would be the black hole itself. Again, with a mass, in this case, of around four and a half million times the mass of the sun. We can measure, we can determine that mass by measuring the speeds of the stars that are orbiting around it. There are many stars orbiting around it. We can measure their speeds, use uh, the orbital motions in order to get the mass. 
this extremely hot gas heated by the tidal forces of the black hole, and that hot gas is emitting intense X, uh, X rays and gamma rays, all of which are used to study this black hole at the center of the Milky Way. And we believe that virtually all spiral galaxies and giant elliptical galaxies that we'll talk about later, we believe they all contain black holes in their centers. This may be the seed, the gravitational seed, that allows the galaxy to form in the first place. We're still not sure about that, but that's what the models suggest. That leaves us now, that brings us to the galactic halo. So, to put it into context, once again, right, so these are the parts of the galaxy, the disk, the ball, and then the halo is this region that surrounds the galaxy in all directions. It is much lower density than the rest of the Milky Way. It is, um, described as having a couple of different components unto itself. There is the inner shell, which was uh, illustrated in that diagram, which is comprised of globular clusters and what we call field stars, just random stars that are out there in space orbiting around the center of the galaxy. This inner shell extends out to about 200,000 light years. So the disk is 100,000 light years across. But when we take into account the inner and outer shells of the halo, those most distant stars out there orbiting the galaxy that may extend as far as about 200,000 light years, giving the overall size of the galaxy twice what Shapley reported in 1918. The outer shell, well, we're not sure exactly how far that goes, but perhaps some significant fraction of the distance to our nearest galaxy. There's also what we call the galactic corona. This is very low density, but high temperature gas that is emitting a continuous soft glow of X-rays. It was first detected at X-ray wavelengths and has since been studied. And this is a gas surrounding the galaxy in all directions. This may extend as far as about 360,000 light years, which brings us to what's called the dark matter halo. Dark matter is implied by the motion of the galaxy itself. Of course, we can measure the speeds of stars and nebulae as they move around the galaxy. And when we graph the speeds as a function of distance from the center of the galaxy, what we find is that the speed profile does not match the speed profile expected from Kepler's laws and Newton's laws. And what this implies is that there is more mass present in the galaxy than what we can actually see. So when we add up the masses of all the visible stars, when we add up the masses of all of the detectable nebulae, when we add up the mass of the disk and the halo and everything that we can actually detect, the motions of these objects tell us there's more mass there than what we can see. There's more mass than what we can detect and in the case of the galaxy, it's about half the mass of a galaxy. So there's twice as much mass there as we can actually detect. And this is a bit of a mystery. What is 
this dark matter. There is some kind of massive material that is present in the galaxy that we, so far, cannot detect. We believe it's there based upon the orbital motions of objects that we can see. But this matter has, so far, remained undetectable. What is it? What is it made of? What are its physical properties? And how is it part of the Milky Way? The, product, or the problem gets even more extreme when we look at clusters of galaxies and superclusters of galaxies. By the time you get to the largest scales of structure, 99% of the universe seems to be dark matter. We'll talk about that in a later lecture. So this is a big mystery in astronomy today. What is this dark matter? Yeah. Um, is it possible that like there is no dark matter and we're just calculating all the matter incorrectly? It's possible. It's possible that we're getting something wrong in terms of the way we add up the mass. Yeah. Or it is possible that gravity on the largest scales does not work the way we think it does. Right? Newton's gravity, we already know, doesn't work very well on that scale. Einstein's gravity, relativity, we have a lot of confidence in. But maybe there's something even beyond relativity that we have not yet figured out. That's another possibility. It's like growing exponentially, and we don't account for it exponentially yeah. also. So, I mean, all we can do right now is go with our best understanding. When the next Einstein comes along and says, oh yeah, by the way, this is how things really work, yeah. you know, we may change our conclusions entirely. You know, there may not be a need for this dark matter. But as of right now, it's the only way we can explain what we see. And of course, that is, we are limited by our current understanding. All right, so this is the galactic halo, and of course, this extends the galaxy far, far beyond uh, the visible disk of the galaxy. And these, this is referred to as a population three environment, which is pretty much an extreme population two environment. Very little gas and dust, definitely no star formation going on out in the halo. The globular clusters, the field stars, are extremely old stars among the very first stars that ever formed in the galaxy when the galaxy first formed. And this dark matter stuff dominates the mass of the halo. This is population three. All right, and as I just mentioned, <clears throat> the field stars of the outer halo have the lowest metallicities observed of any stars. So they're really pretty much just hydrogen and helium. They did not benefit from the chemical enrichment of other generations of stars existing before them. And so they must be among the very first stars that form likely with the formation of the galaxy itself. <coughs> and the current model for the formation of the galaxy has the galaxy starting off as a great big blob and then collapsing down in two or three different stages to form the disk, which gives us what we call the thin disk, the thick disk, and then the halo are the three stages of the collapse of the galaxy to form the disk the nucleus and what was left behind is what's what we see in the halo. So <clears throat> the total mass of the galaxy is on the order of a trillion solar masses. But the majority of stars are less massive than the sun. Right? Low mass stars are much more common than high mass stars. And so we take that roughly 1.7 trillion solar mass mass for the galaxy, and that's where we get the number of about half a trillion stars. But the exact number, of course, is, has a high degree of uncertainty with it. And of that mass, I misquoted it a moment before, 
of that mass, 90% of the mass of the galaxy is non-luminous. That is, not stars, not nebula. And again, this is a big mystery right now in astronomy. What is this non-luminous matter? We can detect its gravitational influence, but we cannot otherwise detect it. Okay? <clears throat> so I think that's, uh, yeah. So that's uh, the Milky Way. Now, do I have it here? try to help you in the, in the few minutes we have left in today's class, I want to try to help you conceptualize just what it is we're talking about. And normally, there's supposed to be a one-pound container of salt in there. I'm not sure where it went. I'm going to have to track it down. Um, but you've all seen that little cylindrical one-pound container of salt, right? Well, to help you visualize the number of stars that are in the Milky Way. Imagine being at the old Qualcomm Stadium. I know it's been torn down now, but you're all old enough that you probably were in Qualcomm at some point before it was torn down. Who here ever went to an event at Qualcomm Stadium? Okay, most people. So Qualcomm can, had around 70,000 seats, give or take. So think back to when you were there and picture all those seats surrounding you and imagine that every single seat had somebody sitting in it. So clearly, we're not talking about Padres or Chargers. We're talking about something else. Chargers are right there. <laughs> anyway, so imagine every single seat has somebody sitting in it and every single person had not one not two, but five containers of salt. The total number of individual grains of salt in the stadium would be roughly equal to the number of stars in the galaxy. That's how many half a trillion is. 70,000 people, each with five containers of salt, all those individual grains of salt represent the individual stars in the Milky Way. Now furthermore, take those grains of salt. Take one grain of salt here and take this, another grain of salt and separate them by the distance between the stars. So if one grain of salt is the sun, how far would we have to put the next grain of salt to accurately represent the distance between the sun and its closest neighbor? The answer is seven miles away. That's how far apart stars are from each other in the galaxy. A grain of salt here, and on that same scale, the next grain of salt, seven miles away. And take those half trillion grains of salt and spread them all out by seven miles. Every grain of salt, seven miles from every other grain of salt. That's how big the galaxy is. Even with that demonstration, it's still hard to picture and imagine just how vast the Milky Way is, not just in number of stars, but in size and distance. And that's just one galaxy out of hundreds of billions across the universe. These are not comfortable scales for people to think about. But this is very much part of 20th and 21st century astronomy. Okay. So any questions so far? All right. 
So the next thing that we're going to do is now that we've talked about the Milky Way, we'll talk about galaxies in general. What are the properties of galaxies and um, <clears throat> how do we relate them to the Milky Way and relate them to each other? <clears throat> so we will leave that for Tuesday's lecture. And remember, for those of you who came in late, uh, we will have class on Tuesday. I will be away from campus on Thursday, so we will not have class Thursday of next week. That's all for today. I'll see you back here next week. Have a good Veterans Day holiday, and if you know any veterans, thank them for their service. Thank you for your service. <laughs> what? Thank you for your service. I wasn't fishing for that, but... Uh... <laughs>